Today is our third installment of our four-part series called Union with God, and with Christ. And it's the end of the summer, so it makes sense that we are in the deep end of the pool as we are seeking to understand the profound and beautiful mystery of what it means to have union with Christ. So what, what does it mean when the New Testament writers describe a believer as being in Christ? Um, Paul uses this phrase over 200 times in his writings. He says things like, in Christ, with Christ, through Christ, united with Christ, throughout all the epistles. But Jesus also uses this kind of language, especially when he is encouraging his believers to abide with him. He illustrated this concept of a deep, personal, connected relationship with him by using the picture of a vineyard. And he uses the imagery of a vineyard where only the vines that are united with the branches are the ones that bear fruit. So how can we grasp the significance of this profound mystery? What does this mean for you and me that we are in Christ? What does that mean? How should this reality actually shape our lives? How should it transform our hearts? What does it look like for us to live into this relationship that we share with Jesus? Is there more to this life than our eternal salvation? Are we missing something deeper and more satisfying that is available to us because our lives are hidden with Christ? And the answer is yes, yes. There is more for us to enjoy in our relationship with the Lord Jesus. And there is more for us to understand and appreciate about what it means that we are actually hidden with Christ. It is a mystery, it is a mystery, but it's a mystery that has been revealed to those who are in Christ. Colossians 1 verses 26 and 27 say, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So today, we're going to explore what does it mean that we are hidden with Christ? Will you please open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, and if you need a Bible, raise your hand and the ushers will bring you a copy of the text. And as you're turning there, let me just give you some context for the verses that we're going to look at today. We're going to look at Colossians 3, verses 1 through 3. But in the previous chapters, Paul was teaching the Colossians about the great doctrines of their faith. And he was exhorting them to declare and defend the truth of the gospel. But now Paul is encouraging them to demonstrate the reality of this union that they have with Christ in the way they live their lives. Because as he knows and as we know, what we believe must correlate with how we behave. And so he's exhorting them, like, now you know the truth of the gospel and now you know how to defend it against false teachers, but you need to know that what you believe now has to correlate with how you behave. So this is what Paul says. He says, if then, and let me just pause and say that phrase is better translated since then. It's assumed that you're, he's speaking to believers. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Seek the things that are above, where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For if you have died, for, excuse me, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Let's pause right there and just pray for the Holy Spirit to give us understanding about his word this morning. Oh, Father, we we just ask that your Holy Spirit would come and make this mystery clear to us and to each of our hearts as we seek to understand what does it mean that we are united with you, that we are hidden with Christ, that we live our lives in Christ, that our life is because of Christ, and because of Christ, our death is hidden in him. Oh Lord, what does this mean? Help us to understand these realities. Help us to show how these apply to our daily lives. Would you open our hearts and our minds today to hear your voice as we dwell on your word together? And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
This idea of union with Christ is a, it's a concept that many of us struggle to understand. I think it's easier for us to grasp the facets of our relationship that seem to be more external than the things that are internal. I think it's often easier for us to grasp when we consider our salvation, it's easier for us to think, well, I understand that I'm freed from the penalty and the power of sin through my salvation. I understand that I'm going to go and live forever with God for all eternity. But I think it's harder for us to grasp the internal realities of our salvation. We have the Holy Spirit living within us right now. Christ is in us and we are in him. And it is true that he changes everything about the externals of our lives, but he also changes everything about who we are at the core of our being. We are made new in Christ. We are changed by Christ. We are secure with Christ. We are hidden with Christ. He's taken our punishment for sin upon himself, and he's died the death that we deserve. So literally, we are safe with him hidden with him. When I was a teenager, I spent every summer uh, riding my horse in Montana. And I often would ride alone, uh, because I'm the only one in the family who had a horse. But my dad, he would secure a pasture in a different location in the canyon every summer so that I could go ride in a different part of the mountains. And on one summer, my dad and I, at the end of the summer, we decided that instead of of trailering our horse back to the pasture where the horses would winter, that actually we would take our, we would, he would get a horse and I would have my horse and we would ride the 10 miles downriver to where our pasture was, where we would turn them loose for the winter. So we had this day where we were riding this long journey, and when we arrived at our winter pasture, we were greeted by a herd of horses who were so eager to welcome us after there had been separation in this pack for a while, this herd for a while. And so when we got there, the horses were all snorting, and they were fired up, and they were all on edge. And so my dad and I decided, well, let's just take a lope around the pasture before we turn our horses loose for the winter. So as we were galloping uh, around the pasture, this herd of horses were chasing us. There were like 10 or 12 horses that were on our tail. And just then, my horse put her foot, her leg, in a gopher hole. And she went down on her nose, and then she rolled, I stayed in the saddle, and she rolled right over the top of me, just as the whole herd stampeded by. It was amazing that I wasn't trampled. Actually, the saddle horn went right here instead of into my body. But I was hidden under her body as the danger of that galloping herd passed by. Now, in the same way, being hidden with Christ means that everything that was supposed to hit us, including the judgment of God for our sins, hit Christ instead. Our lives are so intertwined with his that when he died, we died with him. And because he was resurrected from the dead, we will be raised from the dead. And because he ascended to heaven, we will reside in heaven with him forever. And right now, Jesus is representing you before the Father. He has covered all of your sin, all of your guilt, all of your shame, all of your failure. You are alive in him, clothed with his righteousness and blessing. And when the father looks at the son, he sees you in Christ, forgiven and free. No condemnation. And right now, you and I are actively being redeemed and restored into the persons that God has created us to be. We are full of his Holy Spirit, who is right now transforming us into the likeness of Christ as we grow up in faith and as we mature spiritually. Sinclair Ferguson said this. He said, having the Holy Spirit is the equivalent, indeed the very mode, of having the incarnate, obedient crucified, resurrected, and exalted Christ indwelling us so that we are united to him as he is united to the Father. Here's the simple definition that we've been using for our series. You've seen it before. 
Union with Christ involves a new spiritual reality in which the believer is joined to the risen Christ in such a way that what is true of him becomes true of us. So today I want to talk about this idea of being hidden with Christ in actually three parts. Each part has an actuality and an action, or each part has a declaration of truth and a demonstration of belief. Because as Paul knew, what we believe has to be congruent with how we behave. So as we go through this text, first we're going to talk about how, how you are raised to new life in Christ. That's the truth. And the response is, seek things from above. And the other truth, second truth, is Christ is seated in heaven with God. And our response is, think heavily thoughts. And then lastly, you are hidden with Christ and God, and our response is live in victory and hope. And the, the key truth, I think, of this passage is that knowing that you are hidden with Christ will give you a new perspective, a new perspective about your life today and a new perspective about the future, about tomorrow. So as we look at verse one in Colossians, if we look at it through the NIV, we do the ESV here, but if we looked at it through the NIV, it's translated this way. It says, since then, you have been raised with Christ. It says, set your heart on things above. Our union with Christ, you see, gives us a new identity, and our identity is now associated with him. We are raised to new life in him. We have the spirit of God living within us. So the desires of our hearts must shift away from the things of this world that are just temporal and and deeply unsatisfying, and the desires of our hearts must turn towards heaven where we will be at home with God forever. We know this, right? Our heart is the center of our desires, and our desires motivate our actions. So if we set our hearts on the things of God, surely, right, our minds and wills will follow, So what are the things that you are setting your heart upon today? Just take a moment, just be honest with yourself. What are the things that you are setting your heart upon today? I mean, we're worshiping in church, so it could very well be that you are setting your heart right now on worshiping the Lord Jesus and learning from his word, and that's awesome. But what about Monday morning? What are you going to set your heart upon Monday morning? What is it that you most desperately desire? According to an article in Forbes magazine that was called the top eight things people desperately desire but can't seem to attain, over 700 people responded to this question in this way. The question was, if you could say in one word what you want more in life, what would it be? So there are eight top responses, and number one was happiness. People said they want more happiness. But the problem they identified with that is that happiness is really hard to achieve, and even if you get happiness, you don't know how to maintain happiness. And most people say they honestly don't know what makes them happy. The second thing was money. People said they don't have enough money or time to accomplish all the things they want to do. And many of the people who responded to this survey had six and seven figure incomes. And they still said, I feel like I don't have enough money, and I feel like if I did have the money, I don't have the time to make my money bring me pleasure. The third top response was freedom. People said they want more freedom in life. They desire to be free to kind of live out their purpose and calling, but the reality, they said, is they're actually not willing to take the risk to commit to what that might be, and they didn't feel like their their passions were strong enough to make that kind of investment. The fourth thing they said was peace. They said they want more peace. But the challenge they identified was that they don't have enough clarity clarity about their identity and purpose, and so they can't find peace within themselves, and certainly they can't find peace living in a chaotic world. The fourth thing they said was joy. People want more joy. But they said, how do we find the right jobs? How do we find the right roles in life or the activities that actually bring us joy? And they decided that they're constantly feeling stuck in joyless circumstances. Now, the last three I won't get into, but they were balance, fulfillment, and confidence. But this is what the author concluded from the study. The author said, if everything you're searching for remains outside of you, you'll always be chasing. 
But you see, the joy of being in Christ is that we don't have to go through life seeking satisfaction from external sources. Jesus is the source of life, and he lives within you, and he lives within me. Listen to what the Bible says about this reality. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Paul is not speaking metaphorically. He meant that Jesus Christ is literally dwelling in you through his Holy Spirit. Romans 8.10 says, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. We know as human beings, we're made up of, of physical body, soul, personality, and spirit. And so when we receive Jesus as our savior, he comes into our spirit and he gives us life. And that life extends beyond the death of the body. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Being a follower of Christ doesn't require that we have to strive hard to emulate Christ-like behavior. We have the Spirit of Christ living within us who shines through us so naturally as we just yield ourselves to him. It's the Holy Spirit who helps us to set our hearts and minds on the things above. You know, I was driving in my car last um, Sunday afternoon alone. It's very rare for me to ever be in my car alone, um, but I, was, I had to go to a medical appointment and I was alone for a bit, and I just got this, this wave of thought about how much I hate death. Sounds morbid, but I hate death. Uh, I was thinking about all the people I care about who are facing some sort of physical disease or crisis in their life, all the people who are suffering, my friends and family members. I was thinking about how all of this is just stealing the vitality of their life away. And then I started thinking about all the people I've loved who have died. Like, how is it that, that a personality is no longer on this earth? Somebody that I've known and loved just blows my mind. Death. I hate death. If you know me, I do everything to keep people around me alive, <laughs> spiritually and physically. It's my passion in life. Um, death is just such a violation of life. It just feels so wrong. And I was feeling really grief-stricken about this. And then the spirit of Jesus whispered into my soul, and he said, that's why I've provided salvation. I made a way through the cross to redeem death by providing life right now and for all eternity. Amen. Yes, and I was like, yes, of course you understand. <laughs> this is why he's done this. And because we are raised with Christ to a new life and because the spirit of God helps us to set our hearts and minds on heavenly things, our deepest desires can be satisfied. Think about who you are in Christ. You can find true rest in him. Our union with Christ helps us to release the burdens of our life onto his shoulders, and we can rest in his sovereignty. The word of God encourages to live day by day, one day at a time, trusting in his strength and his power. He provides what we need. We're able to walk with Jesus, following his footsteps as we traverse the steepest mountains and the lowest valleys of life. We acknowledge that really only God bears the responsibility to keep the world spinning at night when we're sleeping. And our greatest prayer is simply, thy will be done. This kind of rest is a kind of rest that can never be found apart from knowing God and being at peace with him. We can also experience true freedom in Christ. We're released from striving to try to please God or from, from living in fear of his displeasure. Our union with Christ means that we have a new way of thinking. The old way of thinking has gone. The new way of thinking changes everything. We are forgiven. We are set free to live into the newness of life. Christ has taken all of our judgment upon himself and he has given us his righteousness in exchange. We are safe and we are secure in Christ, free from all condemnation. 
We are released from worrying that we're not enough because we know that he is our all in all. We also can experience true contentment. The secret for finding contentment in life is knowing that Christ is in you and with you and we are not alone. Our God is named Emmanuel, God with us. He is with us, he is our Lord, he is our constant companion, he is our friend, he is our ever-present shepherd in times of plenty and in times of want. Paul expressed it this way in Philippians 4, he said, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. This perspective shifts our focus away from thinking that we will find our deepest desires met in external happiness or in money or in success or in circumstances or a perfect life balance, right? We're thinking, it shifts us away from thinking that those things are the things that will foster an inner sense of peace. But there's actually no lasting peace in those things. We know that. Ultimately, our union with Christ assures us of the presence of God in our lives in every circumstance that we face and our trust in him to provide for our deepest needs. We also know our true identity. When I was um, in my 20s, I started attending um, a Bible teaching church in Sacramento, California, And one day the pastor called me into his office and he began to ask me a lot of questions about my faith uh, because he knew that I came from a more liturgical church. He was concerned perhaps that I didn't really have my feet planted on the ground about who Jesus was. And so he, he took out a piece of paper, he sat me down and he began to draw. And this is what he drew. And then he asked me this question, where is Jesus in your life? Is he outside of your life? Is he just a part of your life? Or is he center of your life? When Jesus is center, we know our true identity because he gives us such a clear understanding about who we are and about what he's done for us. And I honestly don't think that we can have a true perspective of our identity or our purpose in life apart from him. And when he is our center, he then also becomes our circumference. He sets the boundary lines of our lives in pleasant places. He gives us guardrails for our lives by telling us the truth about sin and how it wreaks havoc on our souls and on our relationships. And then he calls us into intimacy with himself and he works within us to shape us into his own likeness from the inside out. Are you experiencing Christ in this way? Do you know who you are in Christ? Are you experiencing true rest and freedom and contentment in your life, regardless of whatever is happening in your present circumstances? As Charles Spurgeon once said, he said, there is no joy in this world like union with Christ. The more we can feel it, the happier we are. So when we do set our hearts and minds on things above, we will then center our lives on our union with Christ and we will find that our deepest desires are not fulfilled through the pursuit of all these other things, happiness, money, freedom, peace, joy from the world, but our deepest desires are fulfilled in our relationship with Christ who lives in us and through us by his Holy Spirit. So we've established that our union with Christ is experienced through his indwelling spirit But now the question is, where is Jesus right now? Let's look back at our text. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. So where is the Lord Jesus right now? He is in heaven, seated at the right hand of God. How did he get there? He ascended into heaven in his human body, in the sight of many witnesses. We only have a very brief account in scripture of his ascension. We know that Jesus was with his disciples. He was commissioning them to go be witnesses throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then in Acts 1-9, it says, and when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. 
So just like that, Jesus ascended into heaven. He returned to the place from which he had come. Somewhere in the heavenly realm, right now, Jesus is physically present in his human body. He remains fully human and fully God for all eternity. Now, he is present everywhere, spiritually, but he is present at the right hand of God, physically. Where is heaven? We always look to the sky, right? We, we look to the sky and we imagine, oh, heaven is out there somewhere. And then I feel like every time a new telescope is invented, I think, oh, well, heaven must be much further out there than I thought because we keep seeing further and further into the sky. Perhaps we think if we'll go far enough beyond the bounds of the universe, heaven will be there like a city of sparkling lights, right? But heaven is actually not a location on a celestial map. It's a dimension of God's creation where God is present visibly, tangibly, spiritually, perceivably, distinguishably. Yes, God is everywhere by his spirit, but heaven is a place that is permeated by his glory. We see a glimpse of heaven during the stoning of Stephen in the Bible. Stephen was the first disciple to be martyred, and God in his grace gave him this window to see heaven before he died. And this not only served as an encouragement to him as he was experiencing profound suffering, but it was also a judgment on the people who were stoning him for being a blasphemer. It's in Acts 7, verses 54. It says, now when they, the angry crowds, when they heard these things that were, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. This is Jesus post-resurrection, post-ascension, standing at the right hand of God, preparing to welcome this faithful saint into his presence. The right hand of God is symbolic of a place of power and authority. Do you remember how, what Jesus said to his disciples at the, at the Great Commission in Matthew 28? He Remember, he said, right before he disappeared from sight, he told his disciples that all authority in heaven and earth had been given to, to them. He said, all authority, he possesses all authority in heaven and earth was going to be given to the disciples to share the gospel. And then he said at the end that he would be with them always to the end of the age. And I'm sure they're scratch their heads like we do. Wait, what? How exactly is Jesus with us? We can't see him with our eyes. We can't hear his voice audibly. We can't touch him with our hands. Where is he and what is he doing? He's seated at the right hand of God. He's seated there because his work of atonement is complete, it's finished. Our debt of sin has been canceled, it has been paid in full by the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Can you imagine this morning, if somebody comes up to you, they've got your mortgage ledger in their hands, and they say, look at this, and the bottom line, zero, stamped across the page, paid in full. You are free from all of your financial obligations. Like, I would cry because I have a huge mortgage and a lot of years left to pay on it. I'll be working for a long time. But imagine what that would be like, and even better. And what's most important is that our debt of sin has been zeroed out by Jesus, and he is seated in heaven because the work is finished. And so Paul tells us, he says in verse two, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Things on earth are in turmoil. Things on earth are not going well. We're in days of so much discord and unrest. We don't know from day to day when a new war or where a new war is gonna break out, who's gonna lob the next missile, how many more innocent people are gonna die on the planet. We don't know who's gonna be the next president of the United States, and we don't know how our nation is gonna respond to whoever that is. Is there gonna be civil unrest in our city, across the nation? We don't know. You don't know how your children are gonna navigate the next school year. You don't know whether your marriage is gonna survive this most recent storm that you're experiencing. You don't know if your health situation is gonna get better or worse, if someone you love is going to die. Are you gonna be able to pay your bills? Will you lose your job? 
Our worldly concerns keep us so off balance every day because they're just rustling around in our minds, screaming at us because there's so much turmoil and unrest in this world. We barely have enough time, as Pastor Eric said last week, to think about our thinking, to figure out what's going on and what we should do about it. But wait, if Jesus is seated at the right hand of God, he's got this. He's watching over all things. He's paying attention to every facet of your life. He's in control. And if your life is hidden with Christ, you're safe. No matter what happens, Paul tells us in Romans that neither things present nor things to come, nothing can separate you from the love of God. So we have to change our thinking, and Paul tells us we need to focus on things above. In Philippians 4, he actually explains to us how we do that. How do we think differently about every circumstance? He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. We must take every cap thought captive to Christ. We must look up. We must soak in the word of God. We must discipline our minds because we must believe that Christ is alive and he is seated at the right hand of God and he's got this. The work of Christ is finished, but it's not over. Lastly, you are hidden with Christ in God so you can live in victory and hope. Verse three. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, obviously, we're not dead, right? We're alive physically, but spiritually, we have actually died to the forces of this world. In Christ, you are no longer under the authority of sin and evil. You've been set free from both the penalty and the power of sin, and your union with Christ is in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, Literally, what it means is Christ has severed you from the powers of this world, and he has provided you with all the power that you need to live a new life in him. Do you know this is what baptism signifies? When a person is baptized, they're publicly declaring that they've received Christ as their savior, and they're identifying with his death and resurrection. The old self is symbolically buried with Christ as they go under the water, and the new self is symbolically raised with Christ as they come out of the water. And tonight, we're having a baptism service at 6 p.m. Yes, out on the lawn. And there's going to be sandwiches for you to enjoy. And there's going to be great community. And we're going to worship out there. And we're going to witness people in our congregation. Many are children, teenagers, proclaiming Christ as their Savior. So come and celebrate with us. But what does it mean that your life is hidden with Christ in God? The psalmist says it this way in Psalm 27, verse 5. He says, for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Literally, you are eternally safe and eternally secure in Christ. And yet, we're still living in the tension between the now and the not yet, right? Right now, we know our lives are hidden in Christ as we live in this broken world. We experience the inward reality of our salvation now. But we who are in Christ are not yet visible to the outside world. Although we belong to this heavenly realm, we're still living in the earthly realm. Though we are clothed with glory from the heavenly perspective, that glory is revealed from earthly sight. And we're waiting for the return of Christ to come and take us home. So let's set our hope on the future then, when Christ will return in glory. Let's look ahead to one more verse, verse four of Colossians three. Verse three, remember, says, for if you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God, when Christ, now verse four, who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Oh wait, can we say that one more time? When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. 
What a day that will be. That day, everything that is hidden is going to be revealed. Christ will appear in glory and we will appear in glory with him. Jesus is coming to take his people home. This is our future. This is our hope. 1 John 3, 2, he says, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. How do we live in this life with our feet firmly planted on the ground, but yet with our hearts and minds directed toward heaven? How do we do that? We have to live in this reality that our lives are united with Christ, that Jesus is with us spiritually wherever we go, but he is also present in heaven at the right hand of God. And our union with Christ means that we are connected to him at the core of our being, and that literally changes everything about this perspective that we have about our daily lives and about the future. It changes everything. Will you believe it? Will you lean into your relationship with him? Will you allow him to transform you from the inside out? Will you walk in faith? Let's pray. Father, we just praise you. Our lives would be so empty. We would be chasing after so many things that lead to places of futility if we did not know you and walk with you and live with you and be connected to you. Oh, Father, we're so grateful for what Christ has done. We praise you that your spirit is with us every day, that we're never alone, that in you we can find true rest and freedom and contentment, that in you we know who we are in Christ. And we pray that your spirit would make himself more known in our lives, that his voice would be stronger, that we would know this is the way, walk in it, that we would trust you in the hard places. Father, I just, I praise you for just the plan of salvation, that we don't have to live in sorrow and grief over death, but that we can walk in the newness of life and look forward to that day when you will return and you will take us in glory. Oh, Father, we love you. We want to praise you and worship you this morning. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.